Do you know how long my beard is? You, you literally say this every time we get on camera. Nobody knows, dude. Nobody I know. Knows. At some point, there's I want to see the full length. There's a lot of hair. The, uh, I was thinking there is not like a D2C hairspray I've heard of. And I have used the same hairspray for 10 years. You use it on your head hair or beard hair or both? No, my beard hair. Got it. Because, dude, my beard hair otherwise like looks... It's like puffy? Huge. Yeah. I'll send you a funny picture. Like, okay. Out of the shower, it's like... Whew, that's wild. Like Kimbo Slice. Like I love that. I got my mini Kimbo going right now. Since since now I'm in the plunger business, I have to look like a plumber. <laughs> By the way, I'm seeing... Uh, are I'm you seeing in the plunger J- business or are you still shaking in your boots? <laughs> no, I'm not back shaking. In the game? No, I, I, have, I have confidence in swagger right now. All right, there we go. What's up, everyone? I'm Alex Lieberman. Yo, this is Jesse Pucci. And this is The Crazy Ones. Okay, episode 29 of The Crazy Ones. We are back. Jesse, welcome back from vacation. Thank you. It's good to How be was here. It? Oh, man. Have you been to Turks and Caicos? Oh, yeah, I was we there, I was there like two and a half months ago. It was my first time in the Caribbean ever. What? That's crazy. I'd never been to the Caribbean before. Well, I guess oh, man. If, you, if you do, you consider the Bahamas the Caribbean? Yeah, definitely. Well, I was there when I was like eight. So then that was the last wow. time I was in the Caribbean. Yeah, one of our one of the best parts about moving back from California to the Midwest is the Caribbean. Because like Cancun it, is a couple hours away, the islands. And like, if you, it's actually funny. One funny thing about California is there's really not that many places to vacation. Like you can go to Cabo, which is nice, but the beaches are nothing compared to the Caribbean. And then you can go to Hawaii, which is far. It's like and five hours, kids, right? It's five hours and there's a three hour time difference. So the second you have kids... Yeah. Like our, my son wakes up at 6 a.m. So he starts waking up at 3 a.m. there. It's insane. It doesn't really work. So it, it was amazing. I mean, the kids loved it. They had never been. My wife and I had been a few times, but it was incredible. Yeah, low key. The craziest thing when I went to Turks was it took two and a half hours to get there. And it was literally the same flight time as going from New York to Miami. Yet it didn't yeah. make sense to me because when I looked at a map and I drew a little triangle, that triangle was not equilateral. But... um. Yeah, I was surprised more people don't live in Turks because it's so it close. It seems and so they're... underdeveloped for how amazing it is. Yeah, and there's no taxes. Yeah, it's crazy. It's wild. Um, okay, I, I'm going to want to ask you questions about your vacation because I think there's so much stuff we can wrap into business and how do you set things up in the right way where you can actually unplug and how do you unplug. But I decided a cheesy fun game that I do with Carly sometimes that I decide to now do with you. So it's called Rosebud Thorn. Have you ever done this? Yeah, yeah, we do it every night at dinner. We call it high Actually? low buffalo. Yeah, we got with the kids. We call it high low buffalo. What does buffalo mean? Buffalo is like a crazy weird thing that happened. <laughs> okay, so rose, ro- rosebud thorn is similar. It's rose is a good thing, but is something that hasn't yet fully manifested. But like it's on the upswing, and then thorn is like kind of the the low of the week. So uh, you you want to go first for the whole week or for my trip? Uh, do it for the week. Yeah, we'll do it from the past week. Yeah. Uh, Rose, uh, today I was 190 pounds. And, and you're down? Probably eight months ago or six months ago, I was 210. Oh, holy shit. So I've lost That's 20 awesome. pounds. Uh, how? And I'm how? Like, the like a I've lot of exercise? Since... Diet? Mostly diet. I mean, diet. Like I was exercising a fair bit already. And then it's really just diet. I mean, I've never... All these things like keto, none of that stuff's ever worked for me. There's one thing that works for me every time, and it's counting my calories. Yeah. It's just super simple. Yeah, the, um, sa- the same exact thing has happened for me in the last three months. I started using, I think I told you, started using a nutritionist, and I've lost nine pounds. And this, I'm someone who have been at the same weight for the last six years. Wow. And, and I've worked out the same way the whole time. So it's like the first time I, and I've been counting calories. And that's the only difference that has led me to lose it's weight. The only thing that ever works for me. And so, but anyway, during COVID, I was, I got down, I got my weight down and then I kind of came back up as I was getting all this gateway X stuff off the ground. Like I took a yep. few years off, you know, and then, uh, so that's, so that's a rose. good rose. That's good. Uh, thorn. Uh, I'm not good at the thorn. It's type seven. We avoid, <laughs> we avoid the negatives. Um, I haven't been sleeping well this week. That's a good one. Like last night, I did not sleep well. I played reason? tennis until ten thirty, and I think just like I used to stay up late when I did that, but I've been trying to sleep earlier. And then I just like was restless. I, I think you're you're when you've been competing for ninety minutes. I burned eleven hundred calories That's in ninety wild. minutes, and 
you know, I showered, chilled. I watched an episode of Bel Air, you know, the new remake of Fresh Prince. Yeah. And then I still. Is it good? I just, it's good. Uh, it's fine. I mean, it's like yeah. Gossip Girl meets Fresh Prince. Um, <laughs> it's cool. If you're a fan of the show, it's cool. And then Bud. Bud is like something new that's happening. Something that's Bud is out. like something that either y- you're, um, you're, excited about something you're excited that is going to happen in the next week or few weeks or something that like you're seeing like early rumblings of things are looking good and there or there's momentum building in something in your life Hmm. i'm working on a new venture so that's that's a good one because three three and two years wasn't enough uh, there's well, you know, I found I, I there's a person I've been wanting to work with for a while, and it seems like she like we're gonna end up doing something together. So I think that's probably the bud. I will say it was my wife's birthday this week, so happy birthday, Deepika! Oh, love um, that. but so that's kind of a I don't know what that is. That's somewhere rosebud thorn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's a hybrid. She's the petal. Bud, that's the petal of my of my week. I love that. Well, also when you start this new venture, like to me, a perfect episode to do is. Like how you kind of thought about her being a good person to partner with, with like what about her as an operator got sure. you excited? And then also like how you guys landed on an idea that you were both excited about. Um, yeah, so I, we can say, def- I mean, well, I can actually answer both of those briefly. I mean, I, I okay. think one, you, you get to know people over time. And so I've gotten to know her and see her in a lot of different contexts. The other thing I do is at any given time, I'm probably working with like three or four people on different th- ideas. But one thing I found that's just really effective is like, Hey, here's an idea. Like, why don't, why don't you go and let, let's go like, go do this and let's see what happens, see what we can learn from it. And I tell you, having, having done this with like six people in the last year or so, 80% just like, oh, they're busy. They actually just want to go take a job. They yep. don't. So one of my best sort of like, it's a really soft way of, of kind of experimenting. And like, she's like, she sent me a list of people we need to talk to. Like, you know, it's just clear when someone's got that energy to go build something. Um, and so that's been one of the ways I've, I've kind of vetted her and, and several other people over time. And how long have you known her out of curiosity? Three years, three or four yeah. years. Um, the other thing is, is the, you know, the way I did the idea is like actually very simple. I have like 15 ideas I'm very excited about. Uh, and I just like walked her through all of them. And I was like, which one gets you excited? <laughs> and she, she was like, this one sounds really great. And I'm like, great, let's go do it. Like, I love it. Okay, those were good. Good rosebud thorns or uh, high low buffaloes. Uh, I'll run through mine quickly. And then let's talk about uh, your vacation and if you actually got to enjoy vacation. My rose was, I went yesterday. Yesterday was a, a New York City day, which I don't do that much anymore. Um, and I started the day getting a tux for my wedding. And then I went to Times Square and we captured plunge content. And it nice. was incredible. It like you just you see so many walks of life. And I think the highlight was, you know, how there are a lot of these people that dress up in uh, in costume in yeah. Times Square. Right. So there was like Mario Spider-Man. there, Batman, yeah. Spider-Man. So all these people like dozens of characters swarm the plunge and we're no playing way. the plunge for half an hour. So there's a oh. picture uh, we can uh, put it in the show notes, the tweet I put out of <laughs> me literally with the board in front of a dozen childhood characters uh That's all amazing. giving a thumbs up so that was the rose bud is i already mentioned it but i'm super excited to see uh, jay shetty perform tonight i've just i've found it remarkable to to watch this guy's ascent um and how how just the combination of having just really basic but um valuable principles uh and having amazing content strategy that that's allowed him to scale this guy has done an incredible job. So I'm seeing him perform tonight. I'm excited about that. And then the thorn, I was between two, so I'm going to say both of them. I got a parking ticket last night, and I have to dispute it, and it really freaking sucks. $65. $65. But the, the worst part about it is you used to have to pay at like the meters in New York City. Now they have an app that you pay with. I paid with the app. Yeah, yet the ticket said the ticket said, I didn't show proper display of the physical ticket on my dashboard. But how do I get a physical ticket if you're using an app? So I'm pissed off about that, and I will be disputing it, and I will be getting my money back. Um, this <laughs> this second, so young, this, so vigorous. <laughs> I this, just this pay them like, and move on with my life. <laughs> honestly, most things I am like that for whatever reason. Like I have a fire about this. Like I'm not just giving up that money. <laughs> it's like my grandpa who still will drive. Uh, gas station to gas station to look for which place has a five cent lower <laughs> cost per gallon. And then the 
the other thorn is um it's actually why I did a few episodes back the founders journal style episode on imposter syndrome mm -hmm. is I was feeling this past week like imposter syndrome and the different things that I do in my life right now. I was mm. feeling it with the plunge because I was I had the thought in my head, shit, if this Kickstarter doesn't go well, I will have proven to myself that I am a one hit wonder. And mm. I you know, I kind of talked back to it to say, all I can do is control what I can control and put my best foot forward with this. And by the way, if it the Kickstarter doesn't end up hitting its goal, I'm gonna find the next thing to work on. I'm not just going right. to stop and and kind of put up the white flag. And then the second thing I had imposter syndrome about was actually being the host of the show. Like I, because I follow so many people who are just successful content creators online, right. sometimes, and I see, and you, I constantly see these stories of people on YouTube or TikTok who in 18 months got to 2 million subscribers or followers. Like I look at a guy like Alex Hormozzi, right? Alex mm -hmm. Hormozzi got to like 500,000 YouTube subscribers. He has a massive audience and he's done it in the course of a year. Wow. I see these people and I'm like, like, am I just not that good at hosting content? Like what's, what's going on? So that was the thorn this week, but uh, it led to just kind of valuable, I would say self-talk after that. Damn. I really felt that one. Yeah. That's super interesting. I, I I've never really had the, I guess what I've thought of as imposter syndrome. Like it doesn't, I've no, I've never doubted my value or ability to bring in that way, which is kind of interesting. Like it, it, it hasn't shown up for me that way. I think I mean, it's amazing. So where do you feel self doubt? I, I'll do the thing where I'll look at other people and go, Oh, like, why aren't I that? Or, you know, like, like I'll do that versions of that, but it, it won't it, like, I've never questioned my, like my impact on a given situation, like a situation I'm involved in necessarily. Yeah. Like it just does. That's not how it shows up. I think the other thing that I learned at, at some point from my coach, which is sort of the, he calls it creative tension. And it's actually a, a paradigm I was talking about for business planning and stuff. I use it. I also use it for personal growth stuff, which is just like desired future state versus current reality. And, and the whole concept of it is like almost definitionally you can like, you can never, whatever you're getting today is real and what's reality and whatever you're not getting yet that you want is, is of some future state you desire. Yep. And so like one of the most common human thing is to collapse that future state in today and be mad that you don't have it. Right. And it's mm -hmm. like, well, why don't I know how to lift bench press 300 pounds yet? It's like, well, you just, you're at 150. Like you, <laughs> you haven't done the work to get to 300, you know, like, and, and, and so I, I find that paradigm generally pretty valuable or even noticing when I'm collapsing something I want in the future into today. Uh, it, because by definition, if it's not there today, it's almost like the world's way of telling you or the business's way of telling you you're not there yet. Like you, yeah. you haven't achieved that thing yet. I think, uh, I think, um, when I hear what you say, what it makes me realize is like your self doubting thoughts either are self doubting based on comparison or because you aren't at your desired future state yet. And you have to kind of bring perspective in, I think, and this is probably why you feel like you haven't had quote unquote imposter syndrome. And I, I know like for me, I have is it sounds like you don't doubt your abilities. Like you don't have doubt about your abilities. You just have doubt about um, like, have you achieved enough? Are you moving fast enough? Right, like, right. but like, but like you don't question, do you have the skills to do it? And it seems like, whereas like for me, I would say, I do at times question, do I actually have the ability and skills to do this? Is there this, this self-belief that I could pull this off? Right. And right. I actually think, by the way, I mean, so much of this, I would say 90% of this is based on a few key experiences earlier in mm. life. Like I, I, I know these experiences that have just shaped me feeling defeated about my own abilities. Huh. The one thing, you know, the thing that comes up for me, like my coach has said this to me is like, we talked about this when I was getting it. He's like, you haven't really failed all that much, Jesse. And so like one, one version it shows up for me, that's a kind of, in a sense, it's more self-limiting than it is imposter is like even the bootstrapping and all that stuff. Like I talk about it, but I think I actually like, like I haven't, I haven't actually gone for it. Yeah. You know, like this guy, Brett Adcock, do you know, Brett? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, he's building like compute, <laughs> yeah, like he, humanoid he's computers. He built like a, like, Sometimes I look at that and I go, damn, like I'm underachie like, underachieving in the sense that like, I actually think I'm, I'm capable of that, but I won't put myself out there that much because I don't want to fail. Yeah. You're like, so why am I not, am I taking big enough bets? 
yeah, there's a version of that where I'm like, wait, I don't, I actually think I don't, my, maybe I don't have those self, like the uh, imposter syndrome. Cause I'm like, I choose to work on things that I know I can have a high impact. Like I, I feel confident yeah. in my abilities versus stretching myself to the point where then I'm like, what the hell am I doing? You know, starting. Yeah. And, and I've had similar business. thoughts along those lines. And the way I've tried to talk through it is it's not this binary thing. Like I would say, you know what I'm doing with the plunge right now, I'd call that a single or a double. Um, do have I had thoughts about like, why am I spending my time on the plunge right now? A backyard game. Yeah, I have had those thoughts, but also I've, I've had the thoughts like I'm at this point in my life right now where I want to make sure I'm having fun with something new and some new challenge. And I know I'm not going to work on it forever. That's why I look to put operators into the business yeah. who really will love it. But yeah, I've for sure but had the, the whole thought. conversation, dude, like we haven't talked much about my journey with conscious leadership and sort of like, but this whole conversation is one, I mean, just for anyone listening is driven by ego. Yeah. Totally. Oh, my. Oh, yeah. What does it even mean to idea. go for the home oh. run? Yeah. Like the home yeah, run swing. Who is the home run swing for? It's the whole conversation of whether the idea is big enough or not too big or uh, it's all ego oriented versus just waking up in the morning and going, what will, what will make, you know, what will energize me today? What will be something I'm excited totally. to do? And I think the more I've like my practice, it's a very active practice to like relate to what I'm doing from that lens as opposed to the lens of like, questioning the worthiness of the businesses I'm taking on or my ability to like all of it comes from sort of a place of fear or in the conscious leadership paradigm it's called below totally. the line right it's uh, yeah honestly we should do either an episode on conscious leadership or even like you end up uh we could even we talked about doing a book club end up at some point reading rereading the uh what's it called the 14 commitments of conscious leadership yeah 15 we can get my coach on let's interview him yeah yeah we we should do that at some point um I want to uh, push it forward because we have like seven things to talk about today. <laughs> We've gotten through number one. Uh, number two is we we talked about your vacation and it sounds like you had a very lovely time in Turks and Caicos with the family. Um, well, I, I, I will say one of the highlights for me was your son and daughter uh, talking about 60 Second Startup and my use of bad language uh, in 60 <laughs> Second Startup. That, that was a highlight for me. Did you Did you actually unplug when you were in Turks and Caicos? Yeah, I think and this is like one of my unique strengths is, and I, I've been doing it, I think pretty much since I got married, uh, actually on my honeymoon was, I think the first time I did it. And so th there's a couple of just tactical things. One is I will generally take my laptop and I will do email or whatever on the plane ride there and the plane ride back. And so they're kind of these really nice bookends to sort of like wind it down, get every, you know, respond to everything, close it all out. And then when I come back, I obviously have a bunch of stuff there to like also just catch up quickly uh and i think like that helps me sort of manage what i do in between and what i do in between is you know i i will like delete slack delete email uh like delete I, as in like you remove the apps they're gone from my phone like because i i you know and and i've also been trying to look at my phone less like I'll, i've been trying to start the day even at home first 30 minutes not looking at my phone but even mm -hmm. there it's even more extreme like i'm not, i'm gonna go to the beach i'm not gonna take my phone but but I find that if I delete email on Slack, ninety five percent of distractions go away. I generally you know will give the team one person on the team my hotel's contact information, and I'm like, hey, if you need me, there's a way to get in touch with me. Call my hotel, right? Don't call me like don't call my phone. Don't don't call, don't talk to me. And then I'm gone, and and it's it's like pretty effective. You know, one thing I'll say for myself is a lot of this is for me because I'm the kind of person that. If I check email in the morning, even if I just said, oh, I'll just work an hour a day for me and, and everyone's different, uh, my brain will have turned on and my 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 thoughts will have been consumed by all these things going on. And not in a negative way, but like because I like it and it's exciting and it's it's exhilarating. Right. Um, but I, I, if I do it on vacation, then like my day is you're just not, not present. About vacation. You're not present yeah, to your family. It, it won't be vacation. So I just that's that's my way. I fully unplug uh, and it works pretty well. And I think like. You know, it, obviously I'll do a transition kind of thing at, when I'm back in the office. I don't put an auto, out of office responder on. I hate auto, out of office responders. Why? I don't know why. I have no idea. I, like, I don't understand. Like you're especially you're like customer facing with Kahani. You have people you're trying to make customers. If they reach out to you, why? Why do you make them wait no idea. for five I just, days? I've never liked them. I just think they're they're annoying and stupid. I don't know why. I Interesting. Can't, I may, I, I may challenge that idea just because I feel like you you have people who think you're slow to respond. And it's just you're on vacation. Well, I think I think if, if someone's emailing me 
as a customer. I mean, my EA is in my inbox, so that's one thing that solves for it. And will will they answer emails while like she throughout won't the week? answer, but she would route them probably. Like you'll she'll route them to yeah. somebody else on the team, someone else okay. on the team to handle it. There was uh, you told me about this book that you read while you were on vacation about oh, yeah. you gave me like oh, you were shit. great at leaving me the cliffhanger. I think your texts were it was like, dude, this book is crazy. Chiquita just took over the government. Dude, this book is Dude. absurd. They have taken over the So what what's the story of the book you read? So I tweeted out, I said, "Hey, what's a good entrepreneur bio? Somebody write one." And and someone wrote one called The Fish That Ate the Whale. And it's the story of Sam Zamuri. He was a turn of the century immigrant from Russia, Jewish immigrant from Russia, ends up in New Orleans. You know, it's like a poor hustler. He like lived with his uncle in Alabama in the south of America, which is kind of a strange setting for like a Jewish, Russian Jewish immigrant. And, you know, he was enterprising. He was a tall guy. They have this whole story about him. And one day he's just kind of walking around and he's at the docks in New Orleans. And he, he starts describing, you know, he's, he's standing at these docks and he's seeing a banana truck be offloaded. And they have these huge stems and it's it, they're you know, all the bananas are green. But if a banana is yellow, it's it's almost too ripe. It's mm -hmm. called like it's called a ripe or it's called a yellow. Okay. And it's just immediately thrown away. Thrown in That's the trash. That's crazy. Now he's a hustler. Yeah. You and me, we look at that and he goes, What? You're throwing the those are zero? So he goes, <laughs> just give them to me. So the guy gets this is a true story. The guy gets <laughs> All the yellows off the train for free. He jumps on a different train and he, within three days, he starts selling them as cheap as he can to local peddlers who then sell them in the same day, basically at a huge discount to the bananas. So the guy start that that's how he starts his business is literally it's wild. free yellow bananas that he then goes, this is like in 1910 or something like that. The guy's 20 mm -hmm. years old. And then, you know, it, he, it goes through, by the way, it, it gives you the whole backdrop, which I didn't know and appreciate at all about the banana business, right? So bananas are not native to North America. They they are not, uh, they're completely a business capitalism invention. So they were not, you know, nobody ate them in, in 1890. Some entrepreneurs were like, ooh, this this fruit ships well. It, it seems tasty. I'm going to bring it and I'm going to sell it. Next thing you know, they're handing them out at Ellis Island to every immigrant saying, welcome to America. Here's a banana. Today, bananas are the largest <laughs> item sold in the United States, by the way, like by volume. Like of any like of grocery any item? item? Of any item. The most <laughs> volume of units is bananas, right? Like look up Walmart. It, it, that's what they sell the most. And they're completely an invention of like American entrepreneurship and capitalism, right? So there's wow. this, the big company he bought it off of was United Fruit. It kind of gives the history of United Fruit, which was just some guys who went into the jungle in like Guatemala planted some banana. Like they learned about this fruit. They're like, we should bring this to America. Like the entire bringing of the banana was an entrepreneurial exploit. Right. So wow. they give that history, which was super fascinating. This guy becomes a hustler. He becomes a guy who's he's optimizing everything. Right. So he starts, he goes, you know what, let me buy some land and, and grow my own banana. So he's like, I want to move up market. I want to, but I'm mm -hmm. faster. I'm better. I'm smarter. So he starts growing his own stuff in Honduras. He's timing how long it takes you to pull the stock to it. How long it puts you like they, oh they would God. send time and reports. They would send reports back. Just so like he's like he's like a he's like an operational junkie. Operational junkie. He's like living in Honduras. How do we cut the plans? How do we he change the way fertilization works? Like every lever you can imagine to optimize. And he just starts buying up. So he ends up owning forty percent of the land in Honduras, the non private land, through his this business called Kuyamel. And uh, this is what I was texting you about. So there was some crazy trade agreement between England, the United States, and Honduras that would require Honduras to start taxing exports, which would basically destroy his margins if he had to be taxed. And he had mm -hmm. a concession, read bribe, with the local government, with the government in place of the lo localities to not have to pay that because he was investing so much in whatever he was doing. And so this that was tariff already, the tariff already existed or he it didn't exist. It didn't exist. Okay. The United States government went in and the state department of the United States said, you know what? We're going to make you pay a tariff because they owed money to England. This is whatever, some crazy situation. Yep. And he goes to the, the department of state say, or U S uh, secretary of state and goes, you guys can't do this. It's going to ruin my business. Secretary of state's like you dumb banana guy, like get out of here. <laughs> Literally, that's what he goes, you know, you're, you're, I don't care about your banana business. This is like government stuff. You know, it's yeah. really important that we resolve this issue between Honduras and, and the United Kingdom. The reason they want to resolve it, by the way, was they didn't want the United Kingdom to actually come and collect their debt with soldiers 
because uh-huh. the U.S. wanted to maintain full control of our hemisphere. They didn't want a European power getting in. So that's why the United States was getting itself involved in this. So he goes, well, if that's the deal, you know, sure, whatever you say, Mr. Secretary of State. He raises a private army and he oh, and he finds a guy who used to be the president of Honduras. He says, I'm going to back you. And he overthrows the Honduran government. That is absurd. He, he but literally how, invades, how did that help him? How did that help him? Well, because since- then his guy was in there, and then and then they basically his guy's like, I'm not doing this deal with the U- U.S. and and the U.K. Like, and so he successfully overthrew he the government. Completely successfully his ran a coup on the government of Honduras. Okay, <laughs> and this is the third ending of the book. By the way, the book goes on. So then, eventually, like there's all this beef between him and the he's beating he's beating the pants off of United Fruit, which is the big guys. Okay. They start having literally like local skirmishes of their own armies inside of Guatemala and other countries. The U.S. government, you know, the State Department and the Justice Department get together. The Justice Department wants to regulate them from not becoming a um, a monopoly. But the State Department's like, this is causing too many issues. So they get together and they go, you guys have to merge. So he merges. He sells all of his shares. He becomes a you know effectively a billionaire in today's money from selling his banana business to the big business. That business proceeds to get run into the ground, right? So, is he still it, is he still involved at this he's point? He's a huge no? shareholder. He's like okay. the largest shareholder, but he's like he's going to do philanthropy, blah blah blah, whatever. Okay, they they run the business into the ground. He goes, guys, what are you doing? He starts writing them letters. He goes and visits the board. The board is like super pedant. They're like, you're you're just a fruit peddler. You don't know anything. He goes, I'll show you. He goes around and gets proxies for all the other shareholders. He walks into the room in Boston and he fires the entire board and, and oh my god! And he goes, "I'm in charge of the business now." Then the he banana guy is a baller, dude. He is, and then he grows the whole business back up successfully. Like he makes it into this huge thing. It ends up owning seventy percent of the land in Guatemala, forty percent of the land. He, it's such an amazing story. He then Wait, is. By the way, is it Chiquita? Is that the company? It it eventually becomes Chiquita. I mean, okay, it, the it. business does, like there's a whole thing of how it kind of. It gets too big for its own good. Mm-hmm. Like he basically builds it. But but the two other things I'll say, and then I'll stop, is just such a cool story. One is he was critical in forming the state of Israel. He's like a Zionist. Why? How? He, because Israel was, and like the whole book is told in this angle. So I don't know how much of this is like the angle versus reality. This is according yeah, yeah, to the yeah. book, right? The there was a United Nations vote, right? Obviously, the, the terrible things that happened, the Holocaust had happened. American Jews were super concerned. It, it was sort of he, they, the way the book frames it, which I, I believe is Jews basically realized they weren't safe anywhere. It didn't matter. Like if a state turns on you, you're done. Mm-hmm. So they had to have their own state. So they go to the United Nations, England. Everyone's a little on the fence about it. They go, we need a vote and two thirds majority. The first vote takes place. It's fifty fifty. It's not. It's not enough to create the new state. Well, guess what? He's one of the most powerful men. In South America and Central America, he calls these heads of state and he goes, you want to keep your job? You need to vote for Israel. So he literally gets these guys, like he gets 10 presidents to vote in the United Nations. That is to wild. Support Israel. So that's what crazy. Isn't it crazy how these people exist and like no one has heard of him? It's, dude, it, it blew my mind. The, the last thing I'll tell you is the, so the last part of the story, well, there's other parts, but I'll stop, is like communism starts taking place after World War II, right? The United States government's super freaked out about communism. And this the company he's now running, which is the, the 70% monopoly of bananas. It's all bananas, by the way, still. Uh, <laughs> it owns 70% of the land in Guatemala. Some guy comes in to run Guatemala. There's regime change there. And this guy is, at, at worst, a terrible communist and, at best, a symp- very sympathetic to communists. So they own 70% of the land. They start public, they start uh, private taking his land away. They start taking the company's land away, right? Because they're communists. They're like, no, no, you can't have that lab. We don't want you capitalists here. Uh, so he goes, goes to the US government. And he goes, there's communists there. He hires this like famous PR guy who goes around and scares the Senate and the Congress to basically say, we need to overthrow the Guatemalan government. And so then, again, he does the same play he did in Honduras, except this time the CIA is involved, the United States government, with his votes and his, like, and they go and this they overthrow. Absurd. The, How is this not a movie? This is crazy. It should be, dude. They, they they overthrow the Guatemalan government. Officially, the CIA did it, but, like, basically, they've said, they said the meeting would be two people from the CIA, one person from United Fruit. 
So just so just so just to summarize everything, this guy who started his business by grabbing already ripe bananas that were being thrown out, he then ended up owning seventy percent of the land in Honduras, and he successfully. <laughs> created the state of Israel and successfully was behind two successful coups of governments. Yes. That is fucking ridiculous. And I think, you know, the, the I think the other sides of it, the, uh, you know, look, I, I think people say like, this is like the ugly Americans concept. Like this is why people ha- hate America outside of it. Cause of things like this, it was very abusive and exploitative, you know, whatever, according to yeah. various reports, like it, it's like in some ways capitalism at its best and it's like he's entrepreneurialism, but it was, it was very, very aggressive capitalism, right? At a different time, which wasn't cool. The other th- thing they, they do reflect on is like his family, not, not entirely, but parts of his family were kind of a shit show because he was never around. He was in Honduras all the time. And, and, and so there's, yeah. you know, it, it does tell the entire arc of his story, but it, to your point, I just, I'd never heard it. It's very entrepreneurial and there's like real examples of like how they would time each part of the process and cut down the seconds, how that would play into margins, like, and just all the innovation and smart things that he did around the trade. And it's a very entrepreneurial story in addition to just like a wild tale. Yeah. And I think Uh, based on that last piece you just said, like at the end of the day, not to say that every uber successful entrepreneur kind of that like we look up to in society, whether it's the Elons of the world or Steve Jobs of the world, Bill Gates of the world. Not all of them have it to this extent, but where you basically said like there's, you know, he had issues with his family. Like there – with any of these stories, there are parts you can admire of the story without totally admiring the entire person or every part of their yeah. life. So I think the yeah, part I, of this guy just I watched Super having... Pumped on Showtime and I had the same feeling of like on the yeah. one hand, I was like, this guy is in relentless and, you know. Yeah. And then other parts, like, man, this is a very troubled person, <laughs> right? It's wild. And so – that is a crazy story. Um, so would you recommend it to listeners? Absolutely. Yeah. Love it. It was also the perfect length. It was like a five ish hour read on the Oh, page. that's amazing. Like, yeah. That was great. Um, okay. We are going to hop to the break so you can hear a message from the folks that pay the bills. And then when we come back, we are going to talk about a founder I met the other day and we're going to analyze his business and then finish with a startup AMA. So we'll be right back. This episode of The Crazy Ones is brought to you by Electric. Here we are, well on our way into 2023. The markets may still be uncertain, but one thing's for sure. Your business needs a rock-solid security plan and pronto. Need IT you can count on? Electric is known for their lightning-fast IT support, proactive security standardization across devices, apps, and networks, streamlined employee onboarding and offboarding, and a 105% ROI to boot. And you won't just be snagging dependable IT pros with Electric. They will also gift you a pair of AirPod Pros when you take a qualified meeting with them. You must be an IT decision maker at a U.S.-based company with 10 to 500 employees to qualify. Visit electric.ai slash crazy ones to learn more and book your qualified meeting. That's electric.ai slash crazy ones. Let's be real. Business owners can't do everything. There are just too many fires to put out on the daily from managing benefits coverage for employees to navigating intricate payrolls to dealing with compliance penalties. But to level up your biz, you're going to need the confidence to handle all of these challenges. Here's a pro tip. Don't do it alone. ADP's PEO, ADP Total Source, is here to help. As a leading PEO, ADP has seen it all, from helping businesses handle tricky employee situations to managing turnover and compensation. And with up to 53% of small businesses getting sued by their employees every year, ADP Total Source stands with you. They back you with their EPLI policy, and they're the only PEO that stands behind their advice with a legal defense benefit. Terms and conditions apply, but this is a big deal. And the cherry on top? Research has shown that businesses that partner with a PEO grow 7 to 9% faster. It's a no-brainer. Partner up with ADP Total Source. Want to see if your business is a good fit for a PEO? Go to adp.com slash thecrazyones to find out. That's adp.com slash the crazy ones. Okay, we are back from the episode. Um, we just had a wild conversation around the banana billionaire who overthrew two governments and started the country that is Israel. Uh, now I want to talk about a founder I met yesterday. Um, and 
Jesse, I want to break down his business for you. And then I want us to just riff about what we like about this business, what we'd be wondering, like if we had to analyze this business, like we had to, as if we were investors or we're analyzing a stock. Sure. So I mentioned at the top of the episode, my rose for the week was I spent three hours in Times Square yesterday shooting content for The Plunge. And I shot that content with this guy named Arjun, who is building an interesting business. The business is called Doula. And the way they describe themselves is it's a business in a box. And so they do everything from formation, starting your business, to taxes. They're doing banking now. Uh, they create virtual mail, so a virtual address if like you don't want your home address to be online, et cetera. And so when I was starting The Plunge, uh, I hadn't started a company in eight years. And most of these tools that are around now, whether it's like Mercury Bank or Ramp, these weren't around when I was starting The Brew. Yep. And so I decided to use Doula because I saw this guy's Arjun, this guy Arjun's content online and thought it was interesting. And their whole goal is to create the operating system for entrepreneurs. Basically, you have one place for running your business. I use the product. I created my LLC with it. I thought it was very smooth. It, it was done within a day. I hit like five buttons. And so their wedge product was LLC formation specifically mm -hmm. for non-US residents. So the, kind of their key insight was that starting a company as a non-US, starting a, a company as a non-US resident is particularly difficult and there's not one place to do it. And everyone does it with like uh, a lawyer or a tax advisor that you find from a friend. So that's what they started with. And And by the way, I think the reason they did that is they had gotten into Y Combinator with a product originally that was like um, TikTok meets uh, email. So it was like asynchronous communication, but done in like intimate video form. And it was a non-US company. And when they pivoted into Doula, they had to switch from a non-US entity to a US entity. And they ended up having to pay lawyers like $30,000. And they were like, there's no way this is how it should work. So they came out with this formation product. Then they introduce taxes where they, their tax product will do your business taxes every year. And then they have banking. And they're, they're just to give you the numbers on the business, if you want formation done, you pay 200 bucks. So when I had my LLC made, I paid 200 bucks. And then they try to upsell people on taxes, which is $2,200 a year. The business 8 x in ARR, ARR in 2022, they're doing, let's just say, you know, mid seven fit seven figures of ARR wow. and their kind of big vision is they want to basically be the Intuit of startups. So they, you know, Intuit now owns MailChimp, Credit Karma, TurboTax, Mint. They want to be the suite of products that people go to for formation, banking, taxes, mail, insurance, and more. What is your, what's your initial reaction to this or like questions you I would have? I met this guy and I think I had a chance to invest and maybe I'm an idiot if I didn't. Oh, you met him? <laughs> I met him a while ago. I was like, look at my email right now. It's uh, he has he has great hair. That was my first reaction when I met him. January of of last year. That's so funny. Uh, I think they were just getting off the ground. He was asking me a bunch of questions about growth and customer acquisition, of course. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, so audience has told me that they want us to be more critical and more dickish, right? So I'll uh, I'll mix in yeah, a little bit. Let's of hear it. I, I think I think like so. I love the trend. Like I'm the a big believer. What? The the big mega trend, right? The so what or the why now being the amount of new businesses, especially what I think of as like solopreneurs, creators, that is going to, it's exploding and going to continue to explode. Yep. So I, I love that, that sort of like the market trend behind it, that there is, you know, there's, there's a, a rising tide, Agreed. which I think is critical to, to grow the business. I think the problem they're solving, you know, uh, a, it's not a new problem. I mean, LegalZoom was a multi nine figure exit or something, right? In the first internet era or whatever. Yep. I use LegalZoom. Which, Zoom by the way, is a crazy story. We should tell the LegalZoom story another yeah. episode. It's it's crazy. Yeah, Robert Kardashian is like the first. Uh, yeah, exactly. The, fir the first Kardashians, but but so I think that's you know it's not a new business by any means in the in sense of the idea. I think if you can make the problem, I think if you could solve the problem. When I talked to him, and I mean maybe he's changed this, and you experienced it as like. If you can solve the problem to truly make it like takes me five minutes and you do 10 hours of work for me, that's amazing. I, th I think it's much harder than it sounds to do that, just given mm -hmm. the legal parts of it and whatever. And like 
the dream of the stripe type version of this which is like literally just like a little piece of code you can insert and immediately get your thing up and running i think would be amazing i mean stripe is trying to do it too uh with atlas they have this other product so i think i'm like i'm like the product difficulty feels hard uh to me and then of course like what he talked to me about which which is always a lot of things like this is like can you make the economics work from a customer acquisition standpoint which is really just a uh it's an execution problem. I mean, right. It's an execution problem. Can you run ad campaigns so that you can, you guys did it at the brew, like you can acquire whatever the customers are in a way that's the LTV is better than the CAC by a multiple. Uh, and I think, I don't think that's impossible. I don't think it's easy either. Like, I think it's, I think it's somewhere in between. Very Um, interesting thing he told me, which I'm sure you won't be surprised with given how well, like your threads on Kahani did for user acquisition for Kahani yeah. is a very significant percentage of their user acquisition every month comes from his content he creates on Twitter. Yeah. Well, I mean, growth assistant. Yeah, exactly. So there you go. If you can, and I, I might have, maybe I'll take credit. Maybe I told him to do that. But I think <laughs> that was a time when growth assistant was, is, it was crushing it. But yeah, I mean, if you can find a cheap source of customers like that on Twitter, I think it's it's definitely a massive uh, head start to get you up and running. And I think it's and then there's a whole servicing question I'd have for him around how do you actually is it programmatic do you actually have people in the background like taxes you know taxes are that, not a that's their forward thing yeah, well to that point also I think that's a big thing they're trying to figure out because they talk about legal zoom a lot the issue with legal zoom is it's so human capital intensive because right. of the servicing and so their whole thing is how do they do this but with you know a quarter of the headcount right yeah, and I think I think part of that is you have to get probably more narrow on the specific service. It, like, th- if you were doing like a two by two or matrix of their business, you'd say like, what service is is critical, expensive that you can make cheaper, is time consuming if you do it yourself, but there's a way to actually cut that time on the back end. Like, you'd have to mm-hmm. find. And if I were in their shoes, I'd say find maybe that's LLC creation. I don't know, whatever it is, one of those functions. And then stop trying to do a bunch of things. Like, just go do that. I don't know how many, cor- there's 3 million corporations incorporated every year, something insane At like least, that. yeah. So, like, go get 10,000 of them or 100,000 of them. And I think that's another entrepreneurial mistake that a lot of people make, I've made, I'm sure you've made, is, like, we immediately start going wide. And, and like, every well is way deeper than you think it is. There's way more water at the bottom of it. And so I totally. think part of it is, like, th- that's the other fear I would have for them is, like, you said three things just now. And I'm like, dude, those three things sound like a lot. And yeah, like, sound I think like they're hard to scale. I think their view on that is they think formation, like helping you create an LLC, is commoditized, and so their their fear is like a lot of other people can come out with an LLC formation product, and also it's a one time fee. You pay the one hundred eighty bucks, and so I'm sure what's in the back there. I'm sure two things in the back of their mind are: okay, we have these ten thousand businesses that formed yeah. LLCs. Are we not going to extend the value of these people at all? Slash. You know, they're going down like the the venture treadmill. And so I think for yeah. them, they're also saying, how are we raising at a 10x uh, on revenue, not at a 3x? And it's going to be a 3x if you're just doing for one-time formation payments. Yeah, that's a, I mean, that's another thing I would say like the the venture track. This is a great example where the venture track can, can let the tail wag the dog. Yep. Like, look, by all means, if, if you want to go build the Intuit of startups god bless you if that's truly what you want to build then you should go raise money you should figure you have to build all these techie things there's a company called collective that's doing a version of this too um started by uh, an experienced entrepreneur but like i'll just say this like if 200 dollars or 300 dollars, if you're acquiring customers at zero and they're incorporating your llcs through you there ain't nothing wrong with that you know <laughs> totally Dude, I mean, go do go do ten thousand of those, and and by the way, part of it is the the fear of commoditization of business is totally driven by venture. It's not driven by entrepreneurs yeah. because every business you can build a moat around over time, and and you can build some resilience. And by the way, part of it I would tell them is like first get ten thousand a year of those LLCs being created through you profitably. Guess what? Now you have a balance sheet, you have cash coming in the door. You can go and figure out how to get taxes to be done well. That's not to say you don't, ha- you can still raise venture if you want, but I think what ends up happening again with venture is you just don't, you, the, the, the well gets dug very shallow Yeah. for the story's benefit. You go tell the story, then you don't actually have a deep value prop. Then a storm comes and guess what? The, the, the hole gets filled, right? As opposed to dig, if you became the best in the world at LLC Incorporation, 
I don't know if it's a huge business, but there's a there's a meaningful business that would generate cash and like open up a bunch of additional doors. And by the way, you could probably end up raising money because you now have hundreds of thousands of people who have formed a business with you that you have relationships with. And by the way, you have probably a lot more leverage because you're actually cash flowing a ton. Yeah, I mean, ten thousand. Well, let's do the math. The three hundred bucks a pop, ten thousand uh, things. A, th- a thousand would be three hundred. Ten thousand is about, three million. Yeah, three million. So you're talking about at least a million in EBITDA coming out of that business, maybe more. There's nothing wrong with that. And it, and it's not recurring revenue per se, but going back to the trend you're talking about of three million businesses formed a year. Like if you if you can have some level of predictability or confidence that you can convert X percent of all businesses that are formed in a given year. Yeah. Like the real it, business I would that- do is SaaS Pass. Remember we talked about SaaS Pass? Yes. Yeah, yeah, totally. I would get these guys to incorporate through me and I go, by the way, now I'll sell you this thing for a thousand dollars and you'll get a discount at Dropbox and QuickBooks and uh, that's where Seriously. my brain goes. So, okay. So uh, I'll just share a few final thoughts on uh, Doula and then we, we have a startup AMA and I want, you're the perfect person to answer this question. So I'm not even going to try to answer it on Doula. So the things that I like about the business is I generally believe, and you've seen this first hand now so you could make the decision on if you think I'm right. I generally believe that it's easier to build a B2B business than a B2C business. I generally believe that getting businesses to pay for things is easier than consumers. Um, I like that Arjun, the, one of the founders, is very public facing and is creating a ton of content and he's trying to become Mr. LLC. Like That is what his bio says. I like he's mm. kind of pulling the Andrew Guzdecki card of being like, Andrew Guzdecki has turned micro acquire into a verb. He's trying to do this for LLC. Um, I think this business could have amazing channel partnerships because there are a ton of huge businesses out there that require you to be an LLC in order to use them, whether it's Shopify, whether it's Stripe. So like, what if they partner with these companies where you go to Shopify, you go to create your store, you don't have an LLC yet, and you can just click a button in order to set it up with Doula. Rambo, chill. One second. Rambo. Go. One second. Car, can you take him? Yeah. Ram, come. You think someone's here for the? Just take him, please. Please. No, but I know, but please just take him. Please just take him. Thank you. We can keep all of that on the final recording. <laughs> um. So, in terms of channel partnerships, I think like a Shopify, it's in their best interest to get someone to set up an LLC so that they can start a store. Yeah, that's like you idea. said, I think entrepreneurship is on the upswing and I think they can monetize in a bunch of different ways. Like if they bundle, I think they can partner with companies on different parts of their bundle they don't have yet. So say partner with Ramp for like CFO software and they could get paid affiliate money to send traffic yeah. to them. And if it's a big enough channel, they just create that themselves. I think my biggest skepticism is I don't know if the venture route was right for them. It's not a winner takes all market. I just think to your point, I think for the business they're in, it could cause them to go super wide too soon. Um, I wonder how well they're converting tra- transactional clients into subscription clients, if that's what right. they really care about. And I just don't know how much like people talk about how bundles really create a moat like every and I see how that works for certain businesses. Like for Apple, I'm never leaving Apple because everything they add, like I'm locked into their ecosystem because everything talks to everything, but, or like Salesforce, I get it. But for this, I just feel like there's actually a perverse incentive where as you become big as a company, your needs become more bespoke. So you have like taxes, you bring an in-house accountant in, or you go up market with banking to JP Morgan. So that's my biggest question is how strong the bundle actually is for them. Yeah, makes sense. I I think that if you like, one thing he could do, and I've thought a lot about this category for us, even at Gateway X, is like build the product specifically to like a type of business. So, for example, like influencer LLCs. Yep. That's it. And then you actually really think about that customer and solve their specific. Then, by the way, they don't have the issue of getting too big. Most of them don't. Like, and by the way, they have a lot of other things that. How do they do working comp? Work means comp insurance. How do they, there's all these other issues that pop up for them as individual slash business owners who are running kind of their own little small business. And that, to me, that's like how I would probably try to build moats is get, make the best solution for a specific customer segment. Totally. Some things just leave you guessing. Like 
why are yawns contagious? But you know who doesn't leave you guessing? MailChimp. MailChimp analyzes data points from billions of emails to offer up personalized recommendations to help you improve areas like email content and audience targeting. Get started today at MailChimp.com slash guesswork. That's MailChimp.com slash guesswork. Okay, 60 seconds on Startup AMA. The question from our listener is, the most pressing challenge I'm having in my business is generating my first few B2B SaaS sales. I don't come from a formal sales background, and I'd love to hear what stories you guys have or what tips you have for doing it before you have a personal brand like you have. So if you don't have a network or a brand, you have a B2B SaaS business, how are you trying to get your first sale? Yeah, well, I think you said if you don't have a network, I think everybody has a network. Yeah. So let's start there, right? And it doesn't matter how big or how small it is. You have an uncle, you have a cousin, you have a teacher. And in the early days of Ampush, I was 25. I didn't, you know, I had worked at a few companies and stuff. And I just started going, look, going to my targets. Who do I want to meet with? And just figuring out the chain, you know, and I used to do this when it with, with girls when I was a teenager. <laughs> like, I like her. <laughs> okay, my friend knows her and my friend knows that. Okay, what class is she in? <laughs> and so the same exact thing with with uh, with B2B prospects, right? I think the figure out 10 conversations you want to have and you you beg, borrow, and steal to get in the room with those people. Obviously, that means build out your LinkedIn and connect with all your former colleagues from wherever and your your family it kind of means you got to ask around when you're in, in random things and random conversations, maybe cold. I mean, there's nothing wrong with cold emailing, cold emailing. If you say, if you're very earnest, especially if you're a student or you're young, most people will take the phone call. Like if you're just honest, Hey, I'm, I'm, I don't know what's going on with my business, but I'd love to talk to you for 15 minutes. So that's oh, the yeah. other one I do is cold email. But I think the best thing is just work introductions through whatever network you have, as small as it might be to try to land those five to 10 conversations. The other thing is early on when I do this, I always framing it as a, like when we launched growth assistant, the first 30 calls, by the way, half of which resulted in sales were not, were, were and now we weren't being disingenuous. I was like, Hey, we we're we're going to start something new. Would love your take on this concept. Like, is it interesting? We were genuinely trying to learn and get advice so that we're like, I think that's a great someone one. else. Like, could you, is yeah. there someone? And, oh yeah. Oh yeah. You should talk to Bob about your business. And, that's a really, if you're earnestly trying to do that, like, I think you'll end up opening a lot of doors as you, as you, and people just feel stuff. a sense of ownership when something's early and new and exciting. They feel like they're totally. like almost co creating the business and it makes them want to tell other people about it. Totally. I love it. Awesome. Well, this was packed with a potpourri of different stuff today from the uh, banana king of the world to how Jesse truly unplugs on vacation and uh, Doula, which is a business in a box. Thanks everyone for listening, listening, and we'll catch you next episode of The Crazy Ones. Thank you guys so much for watching this episode of The Crazy Ones. If you're an entrepreneur or a builder and want more great startup content, make sure to subscribe on our YouTube channel or wherever you get your podcasts.